Hi, everyone. Welcome to Politics and Prose Live. We are just getting set up for tonight's event. We are letting all of our guests come in and take their seats. So we're letting them populate the Zoom chat room and we are getting ready to live stream on YouTube. And this program will be available on YouTube. So if you enjoy it tonight and someone you love, you think they might enjoy it too, you can, you can let them know to go to our YouTube channel where they can watch this whole event. All right, looks like we are gaining participants. I think we are good. I think we can go ahead and get started. Okay, so if you're just joining in, welcome. My name is Brandy and I'm a bookseller with the Children and Teens Department of Politics and Prose. Thank you for joining us today for our virtual event. I have the pleasure of hosting our event this evening. I'm delighted to welcome our guests. We have Allison Gerber, who is the author of Taking Up Space. And she is going to be in conversation with Lisa Phipps, who is the author of Starfish. Both of these books you can find on our shelves in our junior teen section. I can show you right where they are. Allison Gerber is the author of the critically acclaimed Own Voices novels, Grace and Focused. She has an MFA from the New School in Writing for Children, and she lives in New York City with her family. Lisa Phipps is the author of Middle Grade Books, an award-winning journalist and the director of marketing for a public library where she won the Sarah Laughlin Marketing Award and Starfish is her debut novel. Politics in Prose is happy to partner with Reflections Eating Disorder Program at Dominion Hospital for this event. Reflections is Dominion Hospital's Eating Disorder Treatment Center in Falls Church, Virginia. They have served the DMV area for over 10 years as one of the first hospitals on the East Coast to provide comprehensive treatment at the inpatient, um, at the inpatient partial hospitalization day program and outpatient levels of care for eating disorders for children, adolescents, adults of all genders, and their families. The Reflections medical and program directors are both certified eating disorder specialists who have dedicated their lives to the prevention treatment and recovery of those with eating disorders. We're gonna put contact information for the Reflections program into our chat window um, for anyone who might wish to seek medical help for uh, someone with an eating disorder. You can also find a link in the chat to purchase your own copies of both books, Taking Up Space and Starfish. We encourage you to consider purchasing a book donation for Reflections Eating Disorder Program. Um, if you'd like to do that, donate one or both books. All you need to do is select store pickup during your purchase and put donation in the comment field and we will take care of the rest. For tonight's event, you can ask the authors a question by clicking on Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And we will have time to get to some of your questions after the author's presentation. You can also vote on your favorite question by clicking the thumbs up button. All right, that is all the information I have to give you. I'm gonna turn this over to Allison and Lisa. Take it away. Hello. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> well, um, I'll quickly start by talking a little bit about Starfish. And Starfish is a middle grade novel in verse about a girl named Ellie who is bullied relentlessly because of her weight. And so um, she struggles a lot with internalized fat phobia and body shaming. And so she has a very small pool of support, but they're very essential to her, including a therapist and her dog. And um, so uh, in the book, Starfish, her journey goes from um, struggling with dealing with all the emotions from the bullying and the, and the fat and body shaming to realizing she has a right to, to be seen to be heard and to take up her space and her place in the world, which is how the book got its title. Because if you think of what a starfish looks like, it's, you know, has arms and legs outstretched and it takes up all the room at once. And that's why um, the cover looks like that. Um, people always ask about that. So, and will you talk to us about uh, your book now, Allison? Yes, I'm, I, I love starfish so much. I actually re-listened to it this morning um, and it makes me want to go for a swim because 
it's it's really Ellie's the main character sustaining joy is being in the pool. Um, and it it always it, I, that's sort of my sustaining joy too. I think being in the pool makes me feel free. Um, so taking up space um, is my third novel. It, it it came out just a couple of weeks ago. It is about Sarah, a seventh grade basketball player who is really struggling to feel good about her body and herself. Um, she's going through puberty. Her body is changing. She doesn't really know where she fits in. And basketball is so important to her family that it's creating sort of an identity crisis for her because she was always this really strong basketball player. That's where her friendships were. That's It was just part, a big part of her identity. And now it feels like it's being taken away. And throughout the course of the book, we learn that Sarah's family life is unstable, that the ground that she's standing on isn't always steady and she's not always getting the things she needs. There's food insecurity at home. There's not enough food, even though they have enough money for food. Um, and it's, it's, it's creating a lot of, of internal struggles for a lot of anxiety, a lot of um, negative self-talk is coming from a home in which you're, she's just not getting the things that she needs. Um, and it's also a story about learning how to advocate for yourself, learning how even when the adults around you aren't giving you what you need, that sometimes you need to be able to stand up for yourself and, mm -hmm. and take up space in the world. And that might be space with your voice and that might be space with your body and that might be space in all in emotional, physical, social and all the different ways. Um, and taking space is based on um, really it's it comes from my pain from my struggles with disordered eating and um and food trauma um body dysmorphia so and i will also say that it's also a really there's some fun in the book that it is also about cooking competitions and crushes and friendships and how friendships can be complicated and sometimes they evolve in a positive way and sometimes they disappoint you because disappointment happens and that's real to life um so I, I'm, I'm just so excited to be here with you. Me too, me too. And you know, um, I've been following you obviously, and I know you get a lot of um, comments from feedback from people. And I know myself, I have this jar behind me and in that jar, anytime someone says something good about Starfish, um, you know, whether it's through social media or an email, um, I print it out and I come, I, cut up the little pieces of it and I put it in my jar. And that reminds me that I'm making a difference. It reminds me that I'm reaching people's hearts and minds and making them think. And it also just reminds me as I'm going along working on book two and, and whatever that um, I can do it. I did it once, I can do it again. And it's just like a positivity jar for me. And um, do you do that as well, Allison? So I heard Lisa, I heard you speak about this at your one of your launch events, and I was so inspired that I made my own jar. I mean, mine's a little smaller, but it's just the beginning. It's my baby jar. And I started it when Taking Up Space came out. So on May 18th, I started printing and clipping. Um, and I just honestly, I feel like it's it sort of changed the way that I see things because when I have a moment of negative self-talk, I look at the jar and I can always like take out something from the jar and read it and remind myself that it's whatever it is, is not as bad as I think it is because there's good. Um, mm. I found it to be a really powerful tool and I'm never going to stop. And now I'm like, you were saying that earlier that you have another jar that you're working yeah. on. And I feel yeah. like, why should I not have a jar for like every chapter in my life? Oh yeah. Or every book. I mean, definitely every book. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. Love it. And I'm like, maybe I should go back and do it for Focused Embrace. I never thought about it, but I think it's really, I think there's something very powerful about physically printing out the positive reinforcement and being like, here it is, and like giving yourself an award. Exactly. And even if you're not reading it, you see it and you're reminded. And because, you know, some of the ones I remember and I'll be like, oh, it's in there. I know it's in there. And it's, it's just this feeling that you get of a visual accomplishment of reaching people, which is what we are trying to do with our stories. You and I, both of our stories are all about what has happened to us. I mean, me being um, fat and being bullied my whole life and you dealing with um, different eating disorders and disordered eating and body dysmorphia, et cetera. Um, so, and so talk about why did you write it? Um, 
And did you find any surprises while you were writing as you went along? Because I always find it inform in interesting as a writer when you're like, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> I feel like that's part of the way that I write because I have um, my my previous book is focused, which is about ADHD, and I also have ADHD. So part of the sort of fun writing a book for me is sort of deciding what's going to happen at the beginning and maybe having an idea of what's going to happen at the end, sort of like finding my way through it. So there's always a lot of surprises. I think this book I went into really not wanting to write it. Like I was very reluctant to share this part of myself because I was so ashamed. Mm -hmm. um, I also felt like I didn't know. I think at the beginning of the process, I felt as if maybe the story wasn't important that it took me a lot of writing to figure out that, that how much this mattered. Mm. And part of that comes from disordered eating for people who are watching who've never heard of it before. Um, it's actually not a medical diagnosis. It is, a, it's, a, it's some symptoms of complicated relationship with food. So irregular, anything that is sort of classified as an irregular eating behavior, um, where food takes up a lot of space in your mind and what what why I hesitate around irregular is that 75% of adult women have disordered eating. And that's a statistic from a long time ago. Um, so it's, it's, it's truly probably much higher than that. And so it's not really irregular if everybody's doing it. Um, <laughs> so exactly. what makes that so, so what made it so complicated in writing this book is that I'm, I was writing about something that was common, but also a problem. So disordered mm -hmm. eating took up so much space in my mind and also made me feel bad about myself. It really impacted my mental and physical health, even though it's not a medical diagnosis. And, mm -hmm. and that's, I think I was really hesitant and I really kept sort of talking myself out of writing this book. But what happened was I, I was pregnant with my daughter and um, I knew that pregnancy was going to be hard for me. Like I, I knew from the beginning, I knew going into it that I was going to face some struggles, but I wore a back brace for two and a half years and pregnancy made me feel like I was back in my brace and like I was trapped mm -hmm. and I was like going through puberty again and my body was changing and I had no control and I felt like I couldn't breathe. And it really triggered a lot of the feelings that I had. And I went to therapy and but you can only go to therapy so many times a day to so many hours out of the day. And so in the other hours out of the day when I wasn't working, I had to put those feelings someplace and try to do something with them because they were, they were like coming out of my ears. Uh, so I just wrote and I wrote, I journaled, I wrote like notes in my phone. I wrote on scrap, I wrote everywhere that I could. And just like, anytime I had a feeling, I wrote it down. And so the book was sort of a compilation of this pile of feelings. That's where it started. I was like, oh, this is real. And this is really hard. And I started to share it with some people who I thought might understand. And I started to hear from different people that who were struggling in the same or similar or even a little different ways. People who had totally different experiences, but also had experienced disordered eating for different reasons. And I realized like, nobody's talking about this. This is so uncomfortable. We don't want to talk about it. It's generational. It's like multi-generational. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it gets passed down from like grandmother to mother to daughter to, or, or it doesn't matter your gender really. I mean, really it doesn't. Um, it's getting passed down through generations at your table. The way that we show love is through food and the way that we don't show love is through food. And, and self-love through food as well. Not just love for each other, but you know what I mean? It's like, absolutely. If you're struggling with who you are. You're not going to take care of you, which means, you know, feeding. And um, so, you know, I know statistically, and cause you talked about um, it disordered eating and I know I, I think it was just like two weeks ago, maybe three, where um, they've shown that during the pandemic, especially that it's really hit people hard um, because, you know, the stress level goes up. And if you have any like inkling to struggle with your eating or having uh, body image issues, it's going to come out during a pandemic. When <laughs> you know, when you're comfort eating and you might gain a few pounds or, you know, you don't like shave. I mean, you know, there's all these things that start making you think, you know, oh, maybe I, you know, something's wrong with my body, with me, my image. And um, especially with girls, because social media, I mean, social media is huge, but it got really huge during the pandemic when you couldn't go out and do anything. And so that 
social media element, especially for teens and, and younger people, but in general, really has made it an epidemic. But why? And so it's great timing for yeah. us to have our books out. But I mean, um, you know, you were working on this before the pandemic hit. What made you go, now is the time? I think it just had, I think that no, I think it was the silence around it. Mm -hmm. So like really Instagram was starting to pick up. It was starting to really have an impact. And we were starting to see filters come out where people were changing everything about their body and every, and I think it was right around the time. I mean, it really started writing right around like the Snapchat filters being like Instagram took those filters and, or, you know, took their own, made their own version of it. And that's when filters were really starting to take off and people were changing themselves in this like instant way that something about it really um, made it very obvious that there was a conversation that wasn't being had and that nobody wants, nobody wants to talk about because it's so uncomfortable to be like, because really we're not talking about food and we're not talking about body image and we're not talking about the way we look. We're talking about the way we feel about ourselves and the way we value ourselves and the way we value our children and our the people we love and the way we're telling them that they should go out in the world and be and we're not valuing them based on the, the content of who they are and their kindness and resilience and strength and courage, like all of those things that I know that you and I both value and that we want to instill in kids we want them to value about themselves. It's really hard when you're not hearing and seeing any of that and you're seeing this other thing, that this empty thing, it, it becomes very painful. You said it beautifully in Starfish and I'm not gonna even try to say it correctly, but the cycle of being in a bad relationship with food um, mm -hmm. and you're talking about, Ellie is talking about it. Is it Ellie who's speaking about it in the context of, or is it her friend? Who's speaking about it in the context of um I think Catalina and 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 when Ellie and Kelly and Lena are eating candy and just junk food like any other kid or any other yeah. adult. And so Catalina just and not in a harsh way, but just wants to know how how did you get so big? She doesn't understand, you know, um, and she she's not meaning it in a bad way. She just doesn't understand. And so Ellie talks about how you know, you're a little overweight because of genetics, and then people start bullying you because you're overweight and you seek food and for comfort and then you get a little bigger and it just cycles and cycles and cycles. And it's the sort of like not feeling entitled to it and the rules right. that you speak about in the book and then um, and then sort of like feeling like you have to feel shame and hiding it. And that mm -hmm. cycle is when you mentioned um, the pandemic, it made me think of that, that scene between the two of them and how that cycle becomes it becomes part of the culture and the society because we're doing a lot of hiding because we're at home, we're stuck at home. People are, you know, you're hiding and then you come out. And there's been a lot of posts lately on social media about like, when you see somebody for the first time in a year, don't comment on their body. And the fact that those posts are coming up tells me everything I need to know, which is like, people are, that's what people are focused on. It's like, and, have you lost weight since I've seen you? Or have you gained weight since I saw you? Yeah. Like, How is that the thing we're talking about? It's like, how have you survived a pandemic that nobody has had to deal with in a hundred years and has no idea how to deal with? Maybe we should talk about that. Well, <laughs> how's your mental health doing? <laughs> I mean, that's the thing I think ultimately that we're avoiding talking about, right? So we're using this other thing to not talk about what's actually going on, which is that we're all struggling with our mental health. And, well, and if you talk surface on any subject, you don't have to worry about depth. You know what I mean? And so instead of saying, you know, how are you doing mentally or how are you doing, you know, emotionally or how are you feeling? It's easier to just talk about your skin or your hair or your size. And it's all surface and no substance, you know, but yet those comments go so deep, go well below the surface and really and make a difference. You. I mean, yeah. those comments are the things that I know when I was having my, in the hardest moments, I know because now when they happen, they just, dis I can like, they're gone. Yeah. But I know how hard I worked to make it so that that was the case, that I'm like, I know who I am, I don't need you. Right, and I think you make a great point when you said instant, how those filters make you have an instant change. Um, and I, cause I know I also saw um, a study where that's one of the big things is those filters makes people go, oh look, I got so many more likes when I changed my nose. I, I need to do something about my nose, you know? And then it's just like, and, and some of the noses are dog noses. So I'm like, 
what are you supposed to do to fix that? I mean, you know, it, 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 it defies logic, but it's, it's, it's very, very um, impactful on your self view. And, you know, you tackled two big topics with your other books, um, braced with, a, uh, and then um, uh, all of a sudden it left me, but about oh. your ADHD. <laughs> but braced and focused. Focused. See, I can't focus. <laughs> um, but so what was, was this, I mean, so this is another aspect of you uh, taking up space. How, how was it different, the same, or was it harder? I mean, because, you know, I know wearing a brace was not a fun thing. And I know that was a, you know, a whole experience, which is why you got such great res response to that book. And people have never talked about that. Um, and then ADHD, which is so, so common. And yet people don't talk about that either. But I think sometimes body topics, when you actually talk about your physical body are a little harder to address. Did you think that or? What was that like for you? I did. It's it's interesting because I thought that braced braced it was such a physical book because I was I had to describe the brace and for a lot of people who have never seen a back brace up close I had to do a lot of work with the physicality but I think that this book might have actually this was actually I think a lot harder because in some ways I really wanted the reader to be able to walk into taking up space no matter now of course I shouldn't say no matter because we know that. Um, we know that Sarah is straight sized because she doesn't worry about where she sits. We know that she doesn't worry about her uniform fitting. So there are some indicators of what she looks like, but I really wanted, I didn't, I didn't want to write anything that would trigger readers. That was really important to me. And so her size, her weight, I tried to really limit the number of specifics that I gave in terms of what she was eating and how she was eating, because I wanted to make sure that reader stayed safe. Now, of course, you always have to keep yourself safe as a reader. And so if anything is triggering, um, it's like, you know, you have to put the book down and walk away. But I think for the most part, it is, um, you know, it is fairly, um, it is, it was read by many, many, many um, sensitivity readers, even though this is something that I've dealt with myself and that I have read books that have triggered me. Um, with the uh, with an eye to this, because I had to, I really wanted this book to start a conversation instead of sort of stop the conversation. And I've been so thrilled with how many adult readers have said, wow, we really needed this book. Either I knew that we needed this book or I can't believe I didn't realize we needed this book. Um, and so many gatekeepers have just been like, I went through this and I've never talked about it before. I, cause it's when, when you, it's interesting. I was, I was um, teaching a virtual workshop to kids over the summer, they had no idea that I was working on this book at the time. I was revising it. And one of them said, you know, I before the pandemic started, I had a really good friend who I used to go to her house for dinner and there was never enough food. So my mom and I would have to brainstorm or my and my dad and I would have to brainstorm like, how am I going to sleep over this friend's house and maintain this relationship while also making sure that I'm full? And when she said that, I realized like this big light bulb went off. And this was, I think, the hardest part of writing of writing taking up space for me it's like oh my gosh this can be a tool for friends too like even if you've never experienced which is not a lot of kids most it's, a, it's more than half of kids who have experienced but even mm -hmm. if you have no experience with this you're you're likely a friend to somebody who's going through this mm -hmm. you know you're you're likely a friend to somebody who's struggling with their family struggling with themselves and how do you how can you be a friend to somebody in that situation if you're brainstorming that with your parents how can you help your friend to make sure your friend's getting enough food, to make sure your friend feels loved, to make, you know, it, that's one of the things I really tried to work into this book um, and to try to make sure that there were, the tools were there for all readers so that kids who had never experienced this could build empathy and kids who have experienced this um, could feel like there's a place for them and like, it's okay and you're not alone. And I think you also just create light bulb moments for the kids because, you know, um, I've, you know, when I was younger and I would stay all night with, with different people, um, you know, the food was always an issue, right? Because I didn't feel comfortable eating around people. Most fat people don't. And, but it, it and then they would come to my house and they would find there wasn't really a lot of food in my house. And I think they would look at me like, 
how can you be fat and there not be a lot of food in the house? You know what I mean? Uh, but I grew up poor and, you know, there, there was uh, that issue, but it, I, it makes you start thinking, oh, that makes sense now when I stayed all night with Jenny, why? You know what I mean? And you start putting the pieces together and, and, and um, you, you realize, like you said, I don't struggle with this, but now I see who does, because if you don't know, if you're not struggling with it, you don't know the signs and, and books like Taking Up Space show you some of the things that happen that make you go, oh, well, that makes sense now, you know, and, and it, my book does the same thing. It's like, oh, that makes sense now. That's why fat girls don't want to go out to eat with me because they don't like to eat public. You know what I mean? You would think that they would, but it would be their favorite thing to do, but a lot of them don't. And, um, but I loved what you said about triggering. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit more because how, how responsible did you feel toward your readers? Um, Cause you know, you talked about you reading some books and being triggered yourself. How, um, how responsible did you feel? Did, were you able, do you think like, um, were you kind of timid about approaching some subjects thinking, oh, how, or were you just very careful about word choice or how, how did you tackle that issue? I think for, from a craft perspective, what I always do is I write without thinking about the reader. So my mm -hmm. first and second drafts are always me just putting spilling onto the page and then, you know, trying to raise the stakes and make sure that the character's motivation is there, that the that the story is engaging and interesting and exciting and you fun and you want to be there even when it's scary and bad things are happening that the characters are doing that that i'm really telling an authentic story and then at that point that's when i start to feel responsible it's like after draft two that i start and the only people who have seen draft one and two are people who i know i can trust to like forgive me and who won't be triggered so this book was a little hard because i wanted people in to be early readers who um, had been through some of the things I had been through and, and who had been to treatment for, um, for an eating disorder and, you know, who had different experiences in the world, but I also wanted to be sensitive to their needs and sensitive to the fact that this was sort of a spilling of my guts and that I wasn't being sensitive. So every first email it was like, hello, my friend, she's a beta reader, <laughs> please stop reading this if it's triggering you. And the, you know, the people who helped me in those early drafts were people who felt confident that they could do that. And it worked out very well. And then, but by draft two, that's when I start to think like, okay, who's coming into this book? Who do I need to protect? And who might I not have been sensitive to? It actually helps me to sort of check myself and say like, who am I not thinking about? And how can I think about them more? Um, and this book was particularly challenging. I mean, I think because of the society we live in, because we live in a diet culture. And I thought, I mean, even the choice to make her a basketball player, um, I wanted her to play a team sport. I wanted her to play a non-endurance sport um, and a sport that we don't normally think of as a place where people are struggling with food. But I also hesitated to make her an athlete. Um, you know, it's like this, it was this push pull of trying to make sure that I wrote the most authentic story that I could while also making sure that it was safe. And so I think I'm really proud of where it landed because I think I really found that balance. Um, but so I think if, if somebody's listening to this and they're like, what do I do about, how do I protect my readers? Um, you know, start by not worrying about your readers, start by just telling your story. And then as you go through edits, it's a good time to sort of check and make sure that you're taking care of all the, because you're right, if you're writing for kids, you really have to take care of all the kids, I think. Yeah, it's it's different, you know, if you write for adults and all adults know what they're in for. And yeah. if they don't, they can always just shut, you know, shut the book. But kids sometimes don't see it that way. They feel, sometimes they feel like they have to finish it, even if it starts triggering them or whatever. So I do, I do agree with that, that, you know, you have to be a little more um, cautious when you're writing for children. Um, you know, I think in, in, in Starfish, uh, Ellie obviously deals with fat phobia. Um, and um, she even talks about having fat dar where you can walk into a room and just you just sense who in the room is disgusted by fat people, which is 100% true. Um, as a fat person who's been a fat all my life, I totally get that. Um, so how do you think fat phobia plays in though with um, taking up space? Do you think um, that people are so afraid of being fat that they turn to 
trying to control their eating or their body? Or how do you think that all plays together? I think it can. I absolutely do. Um, I mean, I think fat phobia is everywhere. It's so ingrained in our society. Like we have discussed this in at length and in depth that the fact that there's no legal protection for fat people against discrimination in the workplace. I mean, except in two states, there are two states where where those legal protections are there and they're relatively new. If we don't have legal protection for people, it just trickles down into every other thing. So then in the case of Ellie and Starfish, where the mom is trying to protect her by making her not by 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 encouraging her in all these different ways to lose weight, you know, it becomes the cycle of if you're not if you're, you as an adult are not protected because of your size, then kids who are growing up are, you know, not being protected at home by the people who should be loving them and should be thinking they're amazing all the time. Um, so I think we, I mean, to me, because fat phobia is so ingrained in our society, it's almost impossible to avoid. And so the answer is yes, of course, it plays into everything we do. And there's, I mean, it's, it's, it's in our language. And I've been even noticing that more and more. Um, and even, even the way the word like binge watching, people say that all the time. And it's really great. It's really bothering me lately because like binge eating disorder is a very real, very painful struggle. Mm -hmm. And so to sort of like trivialize it in this, in this way in our language, language matters so much. Um, and we, we talk about it in the scoliosis community because if, up until about a year ago, we were called deformed. And medical doctors were still using that language and we had to have a whole conversation about why language matters it starts everything um yeah. i mean it's the way we base everything so so it, it, it would be impossible to avoid fat phobia in a diet culture that literally we live in a society that values our weight shape and size over our actual health but there's mm -hmm. misinformation about our health and what it means to be healthy and that's part of the mix-up for sarah and taking up space is she doesn't know how to be healthy and she doesn't know how to take care of herself because there's so much misinformation from her coach, from her mom. And it's also partly how she's interpreting that information um, that gets her mixed up and gets her confused about what it means to be a person who can fuel yourself and function and, and thrive. It's interesting that you mentioned health because, you know, one of the big things, um, well, uh, on any side of the spectrum, whether you're um, fat or whether you're know, struggling with eating disorders, which of course most fat people have bought into the whole diet culture, um, is that you know people always talk about, well, I'm concerned about your health, you know, and I'm like, really? <laughs> because really? you know, um, when you're always bullying people or mentioning it or you know like you you mentioned a binge watching and it always kills me when people say hey let's pig out you know and it's just like you know and those words they do trigger and even like in the healthcare field you know um, there's a big movement right now to stop using BMI because BMI wasn't created by the healthcare system to start with it was created by some guy in insurance or actuary kind of thing and they was just curious what it meant and, and so it's so interesting to me that how all this ties together and how it, it's basically just a systemic, hey, let's focus on our bodies instead of who we are. You know, let's, let's focus on, you know, the wrapping and not what's in the box, you know? And, and um, it's very interesting how that works. And, and you mentioned the parents, and I think that that's a big, a big part of it. And a matter of fact, studies show that the more a, ch a parent um, talks to their child who's overweight, well, I hate that word, I say fat, because I don't think there's an over. I mean, who arbitrarily decides what's right for my body shape and my DNA, you know? It the doesn't mathematician who invented BMI. <laughs> exactly. Okay. exactly. Um, but the more they talk to them about it, the fatter the kid gets. It's statistically right. I mean, and that's how it is. And it's like, so I always, when parents talk to me, I was like, one of the first things that, you know, um, experts will say is stop, stop talking to them about it. You know, model it. If you, if you, if you're concerned, you know, go bike riding as a family, whatever, da, da, da. But um, how do you think the moms and parents and guardians and, you know, the people who are of major influence in the kid's life, 
How does that tie into all of this? I mean, I think that is the foundation for your stability and sense of self and how you learn to model, you know, how you talk to yourself. How do you address yourself? How do you care for yourself? I mean, I mean, emotionally, not like how, like not like putting on face mask. I mean, how do you speak to yourself and how do you speak to other people? And do you speak to yourself with kindness and respect and, um, and compassion? I mean, I think that parents are really, I mean, I'm a parent of a three and a half year old and um, as somebody who's like very much at the beginning of this journey, I just see, I see how easy it is to you know get frustrated and get angry but i'm always trying to check myself and say like this is how she's going to learn to talk to herself mm-hmm. and i mean it's one of the reasons that i really wanted to dig into the self-worth part of this and i felt like in taking a space i really um i really tried and i think succeeded in making this a book about how we learn to value ourselves and how we can as parents teach our kids to value themselves and and teach them to value the things that really matter, like what's on the inside and how we treat other people and how we treat ourselves and um, and creating an environment in which they're loved no matter what, no matter what they look like, no matter what they eat, no matter what they feel like when when things are real, like things are going to happen outside of the home that are hard and bad and they don't need to be prepared for that by the parent preparing them. I. I think that it's, 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 it's sort of essential. Um, and it's, it, I mean, I, I see it sort of over and over and over again, the sense of like fear that your child's not going to be ready for what happens when they do face a bully, which and it's, it, it's pretty much inevitable. Um, I wish, and I hope that that changes, but for right now, but having the confidence to know that that's not true can really, that's, that's, that's work that parents can do. By the way, that's work that parents can do right starting right now. Even if your kid is 16, you can start loving them and treating them with all with all the real ways you feel about them, with like the true love. Right now, it's never too late. I, I feel that way. I mean, I feel that way as somebody in my mid-30s. Like I I'm still like happy to accept all the love and accolades from the people who, you know, who say that they love me most. Um like you can always change the course of a relationship at any stage. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, before we head to Q and A, um, I thought it'd be neat if we shared something from our jar. So I'll start. This was one of the things that's in my jar, which we mentioned earlier. Um, this amazing and powerful story by debut author Lisa Phipps is helping to usher in a body positivity movement in youth literature. And I was like, I'm ushering in a movement. I love that. <laughs> You know what I mean? It was just okay. like, because, you know, I, Ellie is based on my story. And so uh, Ellie, I mean, if you read the book and you think Ellie is ushering in a movement, I love that idea. And so that's one of the things, what about in your jar? Such a great visual too, of like you ushering in this movement, like with your starfish, everybody's starfishing in the back of the movement, you know, <laughs> I love that. Um, so I pulled um, something that I got from a reader not that long ago. Um, Dear Allison, I love your book so much. I used to not like reading, but after reading your books, I loved it. I started with Braced and then I read Focused and then Taking Up Space. Out of all of my, out of all of them, Taking Up Space was my favorite. Mm -hmm. Um, The one, oh, um, I'm sending you this message because I want to encourage you to write another book because these books are spot on amazing. I am so glad I was able to find the books. I don't know how I would like reading if it was not for these books. They are my favorite. You are my favorite. I just love them so much. I love you so, so much. Thank you, Jada. Now see, isn't that just like, <laughs> yeah, right there. You're like, even if I get nothing else, that one comment is is worth all the work that I put into this book, right? I mean, I was, I struggled to read so much. I didn't learn how to read until I was in third grade because I had undiagnosed ADHD and all different kinds of reasons. And so to make somebody love books and love reading and to help them find their story, I'm like, oh, I'll, okay, I'll keep for you. I will keep doing it, Jada S. Like, whatever you want. Yeah, tell me what I'm talking about next. Yeah. Sometimes I get those emails. Do you get those emails? Oh yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. I'm like, maybe you should write a story about, and then it's like the story that the that the the, the child should be writing. Um, yeah, yeah. And I'm that. like, you know, that sounds like something that I'd like to see you write. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Well, do we want to see if we have any questions from our audience? Let's do that. It looks like we do. And I have some questions for you too. So um, first of all, thank you for such a wonderful conversation. And it was just like sitting in on a conversation with friends. Um, I could tell that the two of you have such a great uh, relationship and respect for one another. Um, so it was much enjoyed. I just want to state before we move into the Q&A that our authors are eager to chat about their books and the topics covered, but I just want to note that they are not trained um, to take personal medical questions regarding eating disorders. So if you or someone you know um, is interested in um, seeking treatment, we encourage you again to contact our partner, uh, Reflections Eating Disorder Program at Dominion Hospital. And again, that contact information is in the chat. All right, so let's see here. Um, feel free to continue answering in your questions as we go. Um, here's an excellent questioner from Eleanor. Um, for both of you, if you had been able to read your own book in your youth, how do you think it would have impacted you? That's exactly why I wrote it. When I was um, young and, um, you know, I was, I was the avid reader. I mean, my elementary school librarian even made me her um, reviewer because like she couldn't get to all the books she wanted to review. And she would say, Lisa, you know, tell me about the, you know, read this book and let me, and tell me about it. See if you think we should keep it on our shelves. We should put it on our shelves. So I was, I was like, re I read everything. And I was always waiting to find this book where I could see myself. And I never did. I never did. And um, and it just really bothered me because then you think if you don't find a book where that you can relate to that you feel like is a mirror where you see yourself, it makes you feel even worse about yourself because you're like, oh, there's something really wrong with me because no one else is experiencing this, you know. And so I think especially in children's literature, it's very important to do that. And so when I um, grew up and decided I wanted to write books for children, I was like, oh, I know which book I need to start with. And so, um, yeah, that's, I think that if, if well, I call her Little Lisa, I think if Little Lisa had had Starfish, her life would have been uh, so much better, <laughs> so much easier and just um, a lot less need for therapy than I've had to have and um, a lot more joy and a lot more uh, focusing on who I am instead of what I look like. And I think it, it, it would have revolutionized my life, for sure. I had a very similar experience, Lisa. I struggled to find stories where I felt like I saw myself. I felt like I saw somebody. I really felt worthless growing up. I felt like I didn't have any value and I struggled to find characters who were that way, I would always read a book and be like, they're sort of like me, but they never wore a back brace or they don't have ADHD or they, like I could list the things that they actually weren't like me at all, which is why I, st I mean, one of the many reasons that I started with braced and, um, and have continued to write stories that, you know, are based on some of the things that I've been through because they weren't on the shelves. And I think if taking up space in particular, I mean, I just, everything would have been different. I think I would have had a voice in my, in my family. Um, and I would have had the courage and strength to say like, wait, I really, I really do need help and I deserve it and I matter. And it would have changed my life. Yeah. Wonderful. For um, both authors, um, here's a question from Brenda. How important was it to create that ally character? And did you have an ally like that? She, she adds that she really wishes she did as a kid. You want to go first? You want me to? You go first. Okay. Um, so Ellie, the first thing I did in the book was take away her, her ally, which was her friend who was fat as well. And um, because studies show that uh, fat children have even fewer friends than the average, average child, average size child. And um, so, but she does have a couple of good allies. So she, she meets, um, as she's saying goodbye to her friend Viv, she meets Catalina who moves in next door. And Catalina is definitely an ally. Her, her dad is a huge ally. Um, her dog is an ally. And then her therapist is an ally. 
And um, those are essential. And I think the the one of the things that um, is essential in life, I mean, and we've all learned this now, definitely through the pandemic, is alone doesn't work. Um, you know, you the more alone you are and the more socially isolated you are, the harder everything is. Um, and I, that's why I hope that people realize, but, you know, we want to forget the pandemic, but I hope we don't forget certain things. And um, I, I did not have those allies. I did not. Um, I didn't have friends like Catalina and Viv. Um, my dad was dead and my mom was my bully. <laughs> um, and my mom was struggling with severe depression and, and never got, it, got treatment because she thought, you know, if you go see a therapist, that's kind of like taboo. Um, and so I didn't have an ally. And so um, I made sure that Ellie did because it's so crucial. Um, and even, even if I had only made have her one ally, I probably would have made it her dog. And that's because with children, especially, um, you know, when you feel, when you're being bullied at home, you're having struggles at home, it's hard to turn to your parents. And if you don't have a friend, a good friend, if you don't have a therapist, then you can always though turn to that animal, that pet. And because they are totally accepting, totally loving, non-judgmental, a confident who will never share your deepest thoughts with anybody. And so I think it's exceptionally important for children in literature and in real life to have allies. This is one of the things that Lisa and I share is that we, neither of us had allies. And, and I think for, for me, my, my situation was a bit different, but, but also a little bit similar. I wore a back brace and um, that back brace became like this shield that I used to protect myself. I was sort of told by my family, by doctors, by all different kinds of people that what I was going through didn't count, that it wasn't that hard. It could have been worse. I could have been having surgery. And so I was going through a really hard thing. I was struggling a lot and I was being told that I was lucky. And so there was no space for me to be like this kid who was dealing with a medical condition, who was acting like a grown up, who was taking on adult responsibilities. And I didn't get any credit for that. And so mm -hmm. I just like was in so much pain and not allowed to have any pain. And I just assumed that if my parents and the medical community felt that my pain didn't count, that there wouldn't be any adults who, um, who would think that my pain mattered. So I, and, and truthfully, I didn't even give my friends a chance. I just shut myself off because it was so painful to have sort of been so vulnerable and been told that I was lucky in response to that. So I didn't make any space for allies. And I know there were people, there were a couple of teachers. There was a special education teacher at my school who was really knocking at my door and trying to get in. And I if I could do anything differently, it would have been letting her in because I know she was on my side. Like the grown up version of me, like the big Allison knows, like, come on, like, let her in. She just is really going to help you. And maybe she can even diagnose your ADHD. Like, just like she saw me for all the good and all the and all the challenges. And I just wouldn't I didn't want her to see me. I didn't want anybody to see me because I was so ashamed of who I was. And I was so ashamed of my pain. Um, and I agree with Lisa that like in my books, I try to give my characters realistic allies. Like, look, everybody's not going to be, every friend is not going to be the a always ally that you need all the time. And that's why I created Amelia and Ryan in this book for Sarah. Ryan is really there for her. She really wants to be there, but you know, she's a person and she has flaws and she's not perfect. She's not a perfect friend. And Amelia is an average seventh grader. You know, she's a new friend she there, there's some complications in that relationship um but miss varna um the school psychologist is really there for sarah she really helps her to advocate for herself in the way that i know this teacher would have helped me to advocate for myself with my family um had i given her the opportunity to do that i also think ultimately in taking up space sarah's coach is her ally um she also is a person who you know provides information that gets mixed up but mm -hmm you know, is, is also willing to change and see what she did and apologize and take responsibility um, that it didn't, wouldn't, the information she gave wouldn't have impacted every kid like that, the way that it impacted Sarah. Um, so I think like allies can look different ways and you sort of have to, in your life as a person, have a bunch of different allies because sometimes people will be there for you 
And sometimes they're not able to for whatever reason, you know, it could be that they're going through something. It could be that the thing you're going through is really hard for them. Um, so to have just a, a couple of different people who are in your corner who can be there, I think it's showing that is really showing like modeling what's realistic, what you can realistically expect from other people. And also that you have to ask for help, um, that that's a skill that people aren't always going to be able to guess when you need it. What advice might you have for um, parents of children who are the ones that are doing the bullying or for the ones who aren't um, being accepting of others' appearances? How, how can they, what can they do to help their children to, um, to be more open-minded about that? Um, I actually have a bullying brochure on my website under the, I believe it's under the resources page. Uh -huh. um, and I, cause I wanted that. I knew that would be a question that parents and teachers would have like, well, what do I do? You know, what, what, what do I do? Um, and whether you're being bullied or whether your, your kid is the bully. Um, and one of the main things is to A, call it out for what it is, that it's, it's, it's bullying, it's unacceptable, it's hurtful. And the other thing too is to model, because um, I, I worked with a, an expert on this for the, the tips specifically for parents. But one of the things is to model um, what it's like to treat kids, like, like how you should treat kids. For example, um, Judith is the one I, that I, I used her, um, her expertise. And she said, you know, you don't sit there and you say, hey, I noticed your, your friend has gained some weight, you know. Though I, you might think nothing of that. It's just like, just a kind of comment. I, I noticed Tommy's gained some weight or Susie's gained some weight. And you don't think anything about it, but you know what? You just taught your kid that it's not okay to gain weight and that there's something wrong with Tommy or Susie. And then they're more likely to bully them and or they're more likely to have some issues themselves. Um, and so whenever you comment about someone, you never comment about bodies, never. You know, you comment and you say, oh, your friend Susie has got the best smile ever, or your friend Tommy is so funny, or, you know, things like that. You, there's so many things that you can say that are not body related, and that's important. And um, it, I think there's a lot of subtle ways in which we don't realize what we're teaching our children. They pick up on what you don't say as much as what they pick up on what you do say. And so I would, I would recommend that you look at that. And I would also, um, uh, when it comes to, if, especially if the bullying is, is related to uh, the uh, body images and things like that. Um, and one of the things that uh, I mentioned in Starfish is because a lot of times when kids are bullied, they become a bully, right? Because they're hurt and they're getting tired of being bullied. So they kind of take and start bullying someone else because it gets all the focus on someone else and off of them. So, you know, you might want to wonder if, if, if your child is bullying others, is there some way in which your child is being bullied and this is their knee jerk reaction? That could be an issue as well. Again, I'm not a therapist, but, um, those are those are things that I studied quite a bit when writing this book. So those are some things to maybe consider. I hope that helps. I think that also I would really recommend that parents, adults who are listening to this conversation, pick up Taking Up Space and Starfish, that you purchase the book and you read it with your child and you really take time to reflect. You can read a chat. I've, I've been hearing from parents reading Taking Up Space chapter by chapter and then talking about it. Um, and really talking, I think these books actually work really nicely as a, like a pair. It's a really great way to have a conversation about empathy, a conversation about food and bodies and how we're talking about our own bodies and how we're talking about other people's bodies. Um, it's a good way to sort of check how you're using your own language, how you're, how you're interacting with everybody else in the world and everybody else's bodies. And like Lisa said, kids pick up on everything. Um, and it's we because we live in a diet culture. It's so hard to see when it can be very difficult to see when we might be saying something hurtful. 
Um, and it's, I think if you're asking that question, it's really means like it's time to reflect. I feel like any, it's, there's always a chance to sort of check in and say like, how can I do a better job modeling for myself? How can I treat myself better? And, and not, and, and once you start doing that, what's interesting is your brain stops looking at people's bodies. It just stops mattering because it doesn't matter because it actually doesn't matter. And all you care about is the person and what's on the end and you really stop seeing and you stop and you start like feeling that connection. If you just give yourself the opportunity to do that. Um, and I think that reading these books is a really good place to start. They're really strong resources and stories for beginning to, to think about how you can change. I love the idea of reading them as a pair and it's so convenient with Phipps and Gerber. They're right there on the same shelf <laughs> together. So it's like you planned it's it. Planned. Right? Yeah, it's planned. <laughs> one, one last question for both authors from Elizabeth. What do you most want young readers to take away from your story? How about gatekeepers? I think what I want the reader, whether it's a child or an adult, because what I'm getting so much of, which I, I didn't anticipate, but I'm really excited about is how many adults have picked it up. Kind of looks like a beach read, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, the cover by Tara O'Brien, she's out of Dublin, is just so well done that it really gets people's attention. But I've had so many adults read it who have poured their hearts out to me when they responded saying, you know, I'm in my 20s, I'm in my 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and even 70s. I've had women in their 70s email me and say, this is healing a part of me I didn't realize was still hurting. And so I think that um, the important part is that I want people to take away is whether you're hurting now or you've been hurting or you are hurting someone, all of that can change. You know, if you are hurting or have been hurt, you can heal from that. You really can. Our brain is elastic. It changes. Um, and, and if you are hurting people, this is what you're doing to them. It's a very blunt look at what you do to them just by your words or the way you look at them. Because trust me, there are so many people who just looked at me throughout my whole life like I was a monster or a thing. And I've actually been called both of those things. That it changes everything if you realize what you just did to that person. And if it doesn't, well, that's a whole other, that's a whole other ball game. If you could see what you're doing and you don't change, that's a whole other issue. But I think that's what I like. I, I love that. Um, Starfish has been called um, a window, um, a mirror, and um, I think the other one was a sliding door or something. It was like this different combination I hadn't heard before because I'd heard of called obviously a mirror and, a, and a, a window. But so people can see in when they, they, they haven't experienced it or if they're experiencing it, they see as a mirror. And I think that's what I like the most is that people extrapolate. And I've even had people who were like, um, I wasn't, I never struggled with my weight or they'll say I was, I struggled because I couldn't gain weight and they still relate to Ellie or this, for example, um, a lady I've known for a long time. She's exceptionally tall. She's like six foot four and she was bullied relentlessly because she was tall. And so she learned to make herself small to the point where she actually has a hunch now from always doing that, you know, and trying to be smaller. And I, that's what I want people to take away is like, if, if you're hurting, you can stop hurting. If you've been hurt, you can heal. And hopefully you won't hurt others. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, you know, I really, Taking Up Space for me is a book about a person who is struggling to feel good about themselves, struggling with their relationship with food, struggling to feel like their pain matters. And I think right now for a lot of kids and a lot of adults, I'm hearing so much comparative suffering like, oh, but I'm okay and we have enough food and we have shelter and we're okay. like, there are people who have it worse. And like, yes, that is true. There's a spectrum of pain. There are absolutely people who have it worse. You should absolutely open your heart to all different kinds of people and all different kinds of pain, but your pain counts too. And so whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is that you're struggling with, whether it's with access to food, whether it's um, 
struggling to feel good about yourself with your own self-worth, um, struggling with your relationships, with the adults in your life, um, who are, maybe aren't treating you the way that you deserve to be treated or aren't validating your experience, that you, your pain really does matter. And I hope that when kids and adults read Taking Up Space, they leave knowing how much they matter um, and that they count. And I think Sarah, because she doesn't have a medical diagnosis, she doesn't have an eating disorder. She is a person who is, is in a lot of pain mentally and physically, but doesn't have a label. Um, I hope that that kids and adults who come into the story see that you can be in pain and not have a label and that there's lots of people who fall in into a spectrum of pain and and they deserve help too and they deserve love and support and space space to exist space to share their struggles i think a lot of times i i know i mean i hear other adults and i hear myself sometimes and have to stop myself like what kids pain gets sort of squished and put in a corner and it'll get better later and it'll be okay and when you're a kid, your pain is so big and it's the first time and you don't have tools to manage it. And so for adults reading, taking up space, I hope they see that there's ways they can support kids and make space for all different kinds of pain and that it's okay to have pain. That's part of living. That's part of being a person is that you're going to experience all the ups and downs of life, the good and the bad and the hard, and that learning to manage that is, is part of finding a healthy way to live. And that it's really hard at first when you're first, like the first time you get your heart broken, the first time a friend disappoints you, that pain is so big and I can still feel it. I can feel like the tears in the back of my eyes and in my throat and in every part of me. It's the worst pain because you don't have the experience to know that it's going to get better uh, and that it's going to be okay. Um, and I think for kids, I hope they, they leave knowing that they're valuable that they leave knowing that like Sarah, they deserve to take up space. They deserve to have a voice and that adults can be wrong. And I think it's okay for adults to say like, maybe I was wrong. Like that's okay. It's, it's good. It's good for kids to see that you are not always right. Um, I, I think about that all the time, how like how much that's a breath of fresh air when some other adult says to me like, you know, I don't know. I just don't have the answer to that. Or I was wrong about that. I made a mistake. I messed up. I did it wrong. It feels so good. I'm like, oh, okay. They're not like a perfect adult. They're like a regular adult. And I think kids need to see that too, that like you can be in charge and you can make the rules and also you can make mistakes. Um, and kids need to be able to have a voice to say like, this isn't working for me and I need more food at home, or I need to have a plan for how I can feel better about myself, or I need some more support. I'm not getting a thing I need and they deserve to get all the things they need, no matter what. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. And thank you, Lisa, for joining us today and being so open and sharing of your own experiences. Thank you to our viewers for those great questions. You can still click the link in the chat to purchase your copy of Taking Up Space and Starfish. So do that now before we finish up. And you can learn about other upcoming events in the Children and Teens Department on our website, which is politics-pros.com. Just click on the Children and Teens tab and then click events and you'll find a calendar of all of our upcoming events. And you can also, as I mentioned before, you can find our past events on our YouTube channel. So thank you again, everyone. It's been a pleasure this evening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking time to, um, to be here and to give attention to this important topic. And we hope to see you all again soon. All right. Thanks for bye. having us. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you.